My topic today is the snare of Zion. Zion in scripture can mean one of three things. The land of Israel, the city of Jerusalem, and the Jewish people. They are usually interchangeable between those three things. Zionism, on the other hand, is the belief in the biblical mandate that uh, the Jews have the historical right to the ancient homeland. Israel is a tiny, tiny country surrounded by nations that are 600 times its size. As far as population is concerned, the Jews within Israel, 5.5 million, they are surrounded by 300 million <coughs> Muslims and Arabs. Despite its tiny size, Israel dominates world news headlines. Isn't that interesting? For such a tiny, tiny country, it's constantly in the, the headlines. Israel has had to fight for its very survival since its inception in 1948. Israel has fought three major wars, and uh, despite being drastically outnumbered, they have won each time. Israel's enemies long for the day of her complete annihilation. And as you can see there, you can see a picture of a Goliath and David. The Goliath has got the Muslim Middle East, and there's tiny Israel. And you can see the soldiers behind. You've got the media and the rest of the world. I think that is fairly apt. There is, you might remember last week when we had when we showed Dalton's um, video, he said there is controversy because there is covenant. The whole reason why we have controversy is because there is covenant. There is a satanic agenda going on behind the scenes which is out to destroy the object of God's affection, the apple of his eye. Paul says of the Jews in Romans in, in 11.28, as our other Paul has said, that they, the Jews, are still, and that's my input there, still loved by God on account of the patriarchs. Why are they loved? Why are they loved on account of the patriarchs? The covenants. Covenants. Covenant. And because of God's everlasting covenant made to Abraham, Satan has targeted the Jews for their destruction. God, in his very nature and character, is defined by the covenants he makes. God's faithfulness is underpinned by his covenants. Satan wages war against the covenants to make God out to be a liar. What does the scripture say? May God be true and every man a liar. And this is what Satan wants to do. He wants to make God out to be a liar and will do everything in his ability to show the world that God is not faithful. When you consider the four major covenants that God made with Israel, Abrahamic covenant, Mosaic covenant, Davidic covenant, New covenant, Satan is at war with all of them. Satan has declared war on the Abrahamic covenant through the rampant anti-Semitism. And not only that, the delegitimization of Israel's ownership of its land. Because remember, there was a land component of the Abrahamic covenant. There was the blessing component, calling component, and there was a gift component. And what does Paul say? The gifts and the callings are irrevocable. He's not going to take them back. Satan has declared war on the Mosaic covenant. Now, I just need to clarify something. We need to understand, sure, we're not under the law, but the Mosaic law has played a role in preserving the identity of the Jewish people. This is important to understand, okay, because there are still good ongoing aspects of the law. They have preserved to keep Israel's identity intact. I'll give you an example. If you took 100 Australians and you sent them overseas would you expect them to find those Australians just, you know, in another 100 years? No, they'll be assimilated. They assimilate. But Jews have remained distinct. They have remained a people of all this time, and the law has played a role in that. Satan 
has attacked this through the assimilation, with Jewish people assimilating. Satan has declared war on the Davidic covenant by rising up false messiahs. And the ultimately, the arrival of the Antichrist will be the ultimate blasphemy of the Davidic covenant. Now, the word Antichrist in the Greek does not so much mean against Christ. Do you know what it actually means? Substitute for Christ. Substitute for Christ. That's very important to understand. And there will be a substitution coming eventually. We've had many come and go. We've had glimpses of what to expect. But there's going to come a chief bad guy. Satan has declared war on the new covenant by shutting down any opportunity for both Jews and Gentiles to hear the gospel. God is seeking a confrontation with the nations. God is laying a snare in Zion in which he will snare the nations. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed. Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one throne in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. And Psalm 83, 1 to 4. O God, do not remain silent. Do not turn a deaf ear. Do not stand aloof, O God. See how your enemies growl, how your foes rear their heads. With cunning they conspire against your people. They plot against those who you cherish. Come, they say, let us destroy them as a nation so that Israel's name is remembered no more. And are we seeing that today? An increasing amount of... Um, we're seeing that more and more and more and more. Just last week, they approved the atrocious deal with Iran. Just a couple of days before the deal was officially secured, Iran had already said to their country, hey, we've already secured it, and guess what? We get all everything that we have said that we want. We get everything that we want. And you know what that includes? That includes advance notice before their uh, facilities are inspected. It's like someone at the police going to your house and saying, um, Hello, we're here to uh, inspect your house. And the guy's in his jammers going, what, now? He says, no, we'll be back in a month. Oh, okay. So he goes and gets rid of his meth lab. <laughs> but this is exactly what it is. You know, and this is, people don't realize just how extremely dangerous this is. You know, and it's interesting because uh, I'm going to look at this example here in Judges 14 because... The nations don't realize that this is a snare. They don't realize that God is going to be drawing them out against Israel. But also, even Israel itself can be oblivious to what is really going on. Let me check this out. This is the, I'm, going to par, I'm going to summarize this. But basically, this is about when Samson goes, uh, where he sees a young Philistine woman. And um, his mother and father says, isn't there you know, any other woman among her own relatives who would be suitable? And Samson says, no, go and get her, for she's the right one for me. Now check out this last verse down at the bottom, I'll put in bold. His parents did not know that this was from the Lord, who was seeking an occasion to confront the Philistines. For at that time they were ruling over Israel. Let me say this, God is seeking an occasion to confront the nations over his inheritance, Israel. There is a storm coming and the church is not prepared for it. And today, wherever Islam spreads, hatred of the Jews surely follows. In our day, we are witnessing Islamic ideology take the place of Nazi ideology back in the 1930s. Now, here's the thing. In many ways, Islam is far more dangerous than Nazi ideology because it justifies its hatred of the Jews as a religious duty. It's sanctioned by Allah himself. 
to hate the Jew. Art Katz said in Germany in 1986, almost 30 years ago, World War II may be over and Nazism may be defeated as a political and military entity, but the spirit powers that brought Nazism into being to destroy a nation and almost the entire civil world, those powers yet rule over the earth waiting for their next opportunity to insert themselves into the affairs of men while the church sleeps. Isn't that sobering? In the West, Israel and the Jewish people are criticized and demonized on both the far right and the far left spectrum of politics. And for the most part, the left and the sections of the far right have teamed up with the Islamists in a relentless smear campaign aimed at delegitimizing Israel's existence. In fact, Paul warned, remember, in Thessalonians, he said that we would see a great delusion. And we talked a little bit like this about this last month, coming in the form of left-wing progressive liberalism. And it's, it's no mistake that any left-wing political identity has very strong words to say against Israel. They hate Israel. And uh, it's ironic as well because the left also support gay rights. And while Islam, they kill gays. They execute them. You know, just yesterday there was another article where Islamic State are throwing um, alleged gays off the rooftops to their deaths. Sharia law sanctions the killing of gay people. And yet the left have this strange, unholy alliance between the two. Now, if you want to think that Israel is a... The, the left want you to think that Israel is a heartless, brutal aggressor, which is, oppresses poor, defenseless Palestinian people. But is that really the case? The truth is that Palestinians are the victims, but to a certain extent. They are not victims of Israel. They are victims of radical Islam. The Palestinians are victims of radical Islam. That's very important to understand. The vast majority of Palestinians are brought up on a toxic diet of Jew hatred. Killing Jews is not only widely encouraged, it is glorified and celebrated. They are committed to the complete annihilation of Israel from the river to the sea. That's what they say. They chant, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. And what they really mean is complete genocide, complete wiping out of the Jews. Hamas's famous slogan to the Jews living in Israel, we love death more than you love life. They have a summer youth camp training every year with thousands of Palestinian youth trained to be suicide bombers and to die a martyr while killing Jews in the process. This year, they had 15,000 15, young Palestinians. It was a record turnout. They have streets in the West Bank named after suicide bombers. Did you know that? On the official Palestinian TV, they sing songs with the words, Killing Jews draws us closer to Allah. Even their children on Palestinian TV call the Jews Allah's enemies, the sons of apes and pigs. This is actually taken from Palestinian TV. <laughs>
ليش؟ زي مين؟ زي, زي عمو مين عمو؟ أحمد هو شرطي؟ شو بيسوي طب الشرطي؟ بحبس الحرامي والبعمل مشاكل وبطخ اليهود صح؟ آه أنت بديك تصيري زيه؟ إن شاء الله لما تكبري لما طخ اليهود كلهم؟ هاي. كلهم كلهم؟ آه طيب There you go. Now, is that sobering enough? You know, and this is what the world does not understand. They don't understand. They think of the Palestinians as just a normal, ordinary people, you know, but they don't understand that there is an underlying, vehement hatred, demonic, seething hatred of the Jews. And the West does not understand this. They don't understand just how fanatical they are in killing Jews. And it's, and it's interesting, even some Palestinian activists who went over there to help the Palestinians, two of them ended up getting killed by the Palestinians because the Palestinians mistook them for being Jews. This is the reality. This is reality. And this is what the world needs to understand. This is what they need to understand. Now, since the beginning of 2014, there has been an increase of 400% in the number of anti-Semitic attacks in Europe and around the world, compared with 2013. 400%, okay? In France, half of all racist attacks target Jewish people, even though Jews make up less than 1% of the French population. This is global, okay? This is... This is not just in Israel now. This is now spreading out. I mean, in Europe, it is getting really, really, really bad. In fact, Benjamin Netanyahu, they, in his cabinet, they made a provision. I think it was they raised, uh, I forget the amount of money, but it was millions of dollars in which they were prepared to extract all the Jews out of France and out of the U Ukraine. That's how dire things are getting now in Europe at the moment. The largest amount of people immigrating from um, Europe to Israel, well, last year they set records with the amount of Jews coming back to live in Israel. They set a record. Most of the, the Jews were coming from France. No surprise. Canada has seen a dramatic increase of anti-Semitic attacks over the last year and have now hit the highest levels ever recorded by the human rights groups tracking them. Persecution of Jews worldwide has reached a seven-year peak according to the Pew Research Center's latest annual study. And this is a trend that is not going away anytime soon. Most of the international media have decided in advance that Israel is the bad guy in the story. It focus on every casualty caused by Israel while ignoring civilian deaths, uh, deaths in Syria, Iraq, Nigeria, Sudan, Libya, and in Kenya, by the way, well, regarding last year's conflict in Gaza, the IDF released scores of videos of pilots calling off airstrikes and Israel urging Gazans to evacuate. But foreign porters told Israeli news outlet Ynet that a, in Europe, a photo of a dead Palestinian is worth more than a thousand Israeli words. That's what they said. That's what they said. This is the account of the journalist Maddie Freeman. Maddie Freeman was actually part of the, the journalism organization called AP, one of the world's largest, in fact, probably the world's largest. Um, he says this, he says, In my time in the press corps, I saw from the inside how Israel's flaws were dissected and magnified while the flaws of its enemies were purposely erased. I saw how the threats facing Israel were disregarded or even mocked as figments of the Israeli imagination. Even as these threats repeatedly materialized, I saw how a fictional image of Israel and its enemies was manufactured, polished, propagated to devastating effect by inflating certain details, ignoring others and presenting the result as an accurate picture of reality. This is what's happening in the press. This is what's happening in the press. And by the way, it's so, it's so unbelievable. The atrocities that were going on in Syria 
during the time of last year's Gaza war, there was only one AP journalist in Syria covering that. Whereas there are, I think there are close to 400 journalists in Gaza at the time. Only one to cover what was going on in Syria. And there were over 400 in Gaza. Now, Joshua touched on this. Paul also mentioned this, but BDS campaigns are gaining momentum. They stand for boycott, divestment, and sanctions, and they basically, these are used by the left to crush Israel's economy. You know, more than 20 organizations in Europe and 13 countries endorse boycott, um, and this is of a particular company, of a Grexco, this is as an example, Israel's leading, or was Israel's leading flour exporter, in which it declared bankruptcy due to the global boycott of its products. Now, Agrexo is just one example. Look, this is, I've taken this from um, the website of a prominent organization involved in BDS. They said this, We know it works. When EU countries issued guidelines not to fund the illegal Israeli settlements, it caused an earthquake in the cabinet. And when citizens successfully persuaded a Dutch pension fund, PGGM, to withdraw, it created a political storm. There is no secret what they want to do. They want to take away Israel's ability to defend herself in the face of this <coughs> demonic rage of Islamic fundamentalism. Most of the Western universities are now infested with a virulent anti-Zionist hatred and many have apartheid, Israel Apartheid Week on their campuses, which is an in initiative of the Muslim Students Association. We have that here in Australia as well. We have it here in Australia as well. Last month, the UK's National Union of Students voted to boycott Israel. This is the national body that represents students in the UK. Voted to boycott Israel. The University of Johannesburg has cut its links with Beshiva's Ben-Gurion University. The French University, Aix and Province cancelled a meeting with Israeli writer Esther Orner after a boycott by Arab authors. Norwegian universities are also conducting an implicit boycott of Israel, and on and on and on. The boycott is economic. The boycott is cultural. The boycott is educational. They are trying to strangle the life out of Israel from every possible angle. But this will give you an idea of what we are facing in, in our current universities. My name is Jumana Imad Musa Ahmed Al Bahri, um, and I'm a student here at UCSD. You condemn Hamas. Would I condemn Hamas? As a terrorist or a genocidal organization. Are you asking me to put myself on a cross? If I say something, I'm sure that I will be arrested for reasons of homeland security. Okay, I'll put it to you this way. I'm a Jew. The head of Hezbollah has said that he hopes that we will gather in Israel so he doesn't have to hunt us down globally. For it or against it? For it. Wow. Wow. This is what we are seeing, and this is happening all over all the campuses across the United States, across Europe, even here in, in Australia. So this is what is happening. And as Paul mentioned, we're also seeing this movement happening in the church. In the church. <laughs> the last place you expect to find it. Destructive teaching called replacement theology. It's spreading through the church like an aggressive cancer. In many churches these days, and um, Paul has learned ex from experience from firsthand from a certain churches. I'm sure many of you have experienced this firsthand, where there are churches who don't want to have anything to do with Israel and Zionism. U.S. denominations such as the Presbyterian Church USA and United Methodists have both adopted anti-Israel resolutions in their churches. On the PC USA resolution, um, one of the elders says, is, is this biblical Israel? Is the, modern state of, um, is the modern state of Israel? The resolution asked, citing a Palestinian-American Presbyterian who was a ruling elder of the church who was upset 
and uneasy with the word Israel in a hymn. The members of the church concluded that this language is inflammatory, misleading and hurtful. And here's the thing, even Jews are critical of Israel. Would you believe, you probably would believe it, but some of the leaders of the BDS organizations are Jews themselves. Now, how does that work? What? I don't get that. Well, if, you, and this is the thing when you need to understand about the movement of the left. The movement of the left are self-loathing. They loathe themselves. You can always tell a leftist because whenever it comes to Australia Day or American Independence Day, they spread all these things about how terrible their country is. You know, they are self-loathing, and um, they are, and the many of them, many of them uh, of the, of the Jews, secular Jews, are a part of that. Now, just this week, the LA Jewish Journal survey found that 49% of American Jews support the Iranian nuclear deal. Only 40% of Jews believe God is real to the Jewish people. 27% say God didn't, and another 5% said they don't know. And 28% said they didn't believe in God at all. And sadly, many more Jews on the left of the political spectrum, there are many more on the left than do embrace conservative values. And look at this. No surprise, American Jews voted 78% for Obama in 2008, 69% in 2012. Or oh, they've gotten what they voted for. The bias against Israel, the United Nations, and this is a, a big one, is truly breathtaking to behold. The bias has become so much of a problem that even UN Secretary General Ban Ki moon admitted Israel has suffered from bias and even discrimination at the UN. Professor Anne Bievsky, director of the Toro. Institute on Human Rights and the Holocaust has labeled the UN the leading global purveyor of anti-Semitism and inserting murderous intolerance towards the Jewish people. This is the UN, folks. The UN. Around 35% of all resolutions and decisions approved by the UN's Human Rights Council target Israel. If that's not anti-Semitism, what is? Additionally, 50% of the emergency sessions held by the UN's General Assembly over the past 60 years were convened to denounce Israel. No such session has been called on any other state in over 30 years. In 2013, 70% of the General Assembly re resolutions targeting a specific country for human rights abuses focused on Israel. Islam is gaining more and more of an influence at the UN, and now we have a UN Human Rights Commissioner. She heads up the whole shebang. A devout Muslim. Pile has said that Zionism equals racism. And again, Pr Professor Ann Bevsky documents the growing Islamiz Islamization of, e of the United Nations in her message. In fact, you can watch this on YouTube. Her whole um, uh, message, she says, uh, Islam hijacking the UN Human Rights Council, in which she laments as a growing concern. Now, I want to show you this picture. Do you know what this is? It's a, you can see that it's a scripture. Do you know where that is? It's just outside the UN headquarters in New York. It's just outside. It's, it's actually part of the UN headquarters. Okay. So what are they implying? They are implying that they will, be, they will cause the nations to beat their swords in the plowshares and their spears in the printing hooks. It says, Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, and neither shall they learn war anymore. They're quoting from Isaiah chapter 2. But you know what? It's only half of the verse. Half of the verse. What does the first half of the verse say? He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. Who is he? When he comes, when Yeshua comes, when Jesus comes, he will judge between the nations and he will settle disputes for the peoples, not the UN. 
And if anything, the demonic force behind the UN, God will use that in which he will draw out the nations against his inheritance. Check this out. Zechariah 12 verses 2 to 3. I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that sends all the surrounding peoples reeling. Judah will be, see, will be besieged as well as Jerusalem. This is in the future. And by the way, the greatest suffering of the Jewish people is not in the past. It's in the future. The prophet Jeremiah refers to this as the time of Jacob's trouble. On that day, when the nations of the earth are gathered against her, I will make Jerusalem as an immovable rock for all the nations and all who try to move it will injure themselves. And in another chapter over in Zechariah 14, I will gather, this is God speaking, I will gather all the nations to Jerusalem. He is setting a snare in Zion. I will gather the nations to Jerusalem to fight against it. The city will be captured and the houses ransacked and the women raped. Interestingly, Jesus said the same thing in the Olivet Discourse. Half of the city will go into exile, but the rest of the people will not be taken from the city. And then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. Hallelujah. When you see Jerusalem being surrounded, and this is Jesus speaking, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. And let, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and let those in the city get out. And let those in the country not enter that city. Remember what Jesus said, how terrible it will be for pregnant women and nursing mothers. It's going to be horrible. And her obedience, God, and this is important to understand, in her obedience, God uses Israel to be a blessing to the nations. Yet, in her disobedience, God uses the nations to bring judgment on Israel. Isn't that interesting how that works? God always deals with his people first. He does this in dealing, and this is what he does, not only just with Israel, but he does this with the church. Judgment begins with the house of God. Israel is not a perfect nation by any stretch of the imagination. They make mistakes just like any other nation does. And in some circumstances, they have wronged the Palestinians in some circumstances, but certainly not to the degree that the Palestinians are protesting. Certainly not to the degree of that. And what should our attitude be toward Israel? I mean, and here's the thing, and this is why I don't call myself, I prefer to use the term a friend of Israel. I wouldn't say that I'm pro-pro-Israel like giddy, yay, hurrah, Israel. No, no. I'm a friend of Israel and there's a distinct difference because a friend will come alongside and will say, hey, what you're doing there is wrong. Okay? This is the difference between the two. And now our attitude should be the same with Jeremiah. And by the way, my goodness, Israel, since 1948, they have aborted 1.5 million unborn babies since 1948. Do you know how many children were killed in the Holocaust? 1.5 million. 1.5 million. And they've aborted 1.5 million unborn babies since 1948. Do you know, it was only weeks ago, Tel Aviv had a gay pride parade of over 100,000 people. 100,000 people in the streets of Tel Aviv celebrating sodomy. What was God thinking? So what should our attitude be to Israel? Our attitude should be like Jeremiah. He stood against Israel in her sin, for her in her intercession, by her in her shame and with her in her suffering. We need to stand with her in her suffering and let us do that, do the same.
God first dealt with his people when he sent the Jews into exile in Babylon. And then after their punishment was complete, he dealt with the nations who treacherously dealt with Israel. God says to Israel, and this is in Isaiah 10, 25, Very soon my anger against you will end and my wrath will be directed to their destruction. That's an important thing to understand. God will always deal with his people first and then he will deal with the oppressors. And this, this is an amazing verse. Joel 3, chapter 2. Uh, chapter 3, verse 2. I will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat and there I will put them on trial for what they did to my inheritance. Inheritance. Who? The church? No. My people Israel. Because they scattered my people among the nations. Has that happened? Yes. And they divided up my land. Are they in the process of doing that right now? Yes, absolutely. The Americans have been pushing, forcing, using every diplomatic maneuver under the sun to get Israel to give up more and more land. In the whole land, declares the Lord, and this is Zechariah 13. And by the way, let me just say this. God never fails to give us a witness from history. He never fails to give us a witness from history. When it comes to the end times, he never fails to give us a witness. With every significant event that God does, he gives us a witness from history. God does not do anything without he first tell the prophets. And a lot of the times, history is a prophet for us. Antiochus Epiphanes is a great example in the intertestamental period where Antiochus Epiphanes was likened to a, be an antichrist. Um, but we see little glimpses, foretastes, foreshadowings of, 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 of uh, pieces of history. And God is warning us, preparing us what we are to expect in the future. And the whole land declares the Lord, two thirds will be cut off and perish, yet one third will be left in it. You know how many Jews were living in Europe before Hitler came to power? Nine million. How many did Hitler manage to wipe out in the Holocaust? Six million. That's two thirds. Two thirds. That is a glimpse. It's not the complete fulfillment, but it is a foretaste of the time of Jacob's trouble. But it gets good. Enough heavy stuff. Let's move on with the good news. This third I will put into the fire. I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. They will call on my name. What did Jesus say? You will not see me again until you say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say they are my people and they will say the Lord is our God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The salvation of the Jewish people means the redemption of the world and the return of the Messiah. What did Paul say? But if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their salvation bring? How much greater will their acceptance be? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And again, we get to that point. Where are you at? Where are you at? Where are you at in your relationship with God? In fact, I might just put this as a challenge out to those who are watching via YouTube. Where are you at? Where are you with God? Are you lost? You're like a, a sheep without a shepherd. And I just want to say to you, Jesus said that he is the good shepherd. Come into his flock. Some of you may be dealing with different issues. Maybe you have been challenged by some of the things that I have said in this message. You may be even wrestling with the fact that you are anti-Semitic. Friend, you need to let that go. Let that go and acknowledge the king of the Jews. Acknowledge the king of Israel. 
He was their king back then, and he is still their king right now. And if that's you, then I'm going to give you the opportunity to repent and to commit your whole life to Jesus. You might, you might be a Jew. And let me put this challenge to you. Ask Yeshua if he is the Mashiach. Ask him if he is your Messiah, and he will reveal himself to you. You might be a Muslim. You need to study the historical Jesus. Study the Gospels. Study the Gospels. You find out for yourself who al Issa is. And again, he will reveal himself to you. And, um, and look, I think all of us, we need to, um, if any of you feel challenged by that, if any of you, you know that you're not where you should be with God, right now, let's all close our eyes, let's, have, let's all bow our heads. And I'm going to say a prayer, and I want all of us to repeat after me. And if you feel that you need to give your life to Jesus, if you know that you are not where you should be, then you need to pray this prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I come to you. I acknowledge my sin and my guilt. I am a sinner before you. Come and wash me clean. I repent of my sin. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. I believe in my heart that you were raised from the dead. Thank you for my brand new life. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you so much for coming.